Uh, today we're actually going to discuss the anti-Jesus, the Antichrist. So you have come to church on the day when we will discuss the Antichrist, but not to spook you, not to scare anybody, but to actually cause you to be even more happy than you are. Amen. And so sometimes when you see how bad some things could be, you recognize you're not there, and so you can be actually happier. And so today is Antichrist Day. We're going we're gonna to help you find the Antichrist. So, uh, praise the Lord. You can't leave. The ushers have locked the door. But you will learn a few things about the Antichrist. Not everything there is to know. I just don't have time for that, and it's kind of boring. So, Antichrist is kind of boring. All right? So, we don't talk about the Antichrist very often. Uh, but we want to do it today. Give some light so that you can feel comfortable uh, in a couple ways. All right. So number one, we, we don't have to be afraid that the Antichrist is going to get us. All right. All the spooky shows that have ever been made about the Antichrist and the 666 and all the demonic stuff, you don't have to be afraid of any of that. Most of that's just sensational and it's not going to happen. Uh, you don't have to be afraid that any ex-president is the Antichrist. <laughs> Shall I name a few? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, the, the Christian church was convinced that Hitler was the Antichrist back then, till he died. Brother Hagin said, we all had it figured out. We knew that Hitler was the Antichrist until my Antichrist died. <laughs> Stalin and Mussolini, they weren't the Antichrist. Hitler wasn't the Antichrist. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan wasn't the Antichrist. Bill, Bill Clinton wasn't the Antichrist. George W. Bush wasn't the Antichrist. Hillary's not the Antichrist. Obama is not the Antichrist. And you know what? Even the Pope's not the Antichrist. Amen. People have been thinking the Pope was the Antichrist for years. Uh, we don't really know who's going to be the Antichrist, but there are some details that help us, you know, kind of uh, narrow it down to, to a certain country and a certain nationality. But that's not a huge deal in itself because for us... It's not really going to bother any of us. Amen. If you get saved and live for Jesus, it's not going to bother you at all. Amen. So none of, it's just designed to help us know that God's planned the future, that we know what's coming, and that, that just helps us have confidence. Amen. Knowing, what's coming, knowing what's coming does not cause us to have apocalyptic fever. We're not all, that didn't excite us. We're not all excited about those things and then trying to, trying to, you know, pinpoint every single thing that's happening around the world and getting our national news and our world news and making sure, oh, well, let's guess at this one and let's guess at that one and let's guess what this means. Well, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. You know, you can take every single political event that's happening around the world and there's a group and there's Christians that are trying to see where that fits. Well, look, that's a big waste of time because most of it never, ever fits. And if you don't believe me now, just wait another 10 years and you'll see that none of it fit. <laughs> Whatever you got pinpointed, it won't fit in about 10 years. So we've proved a whole bunch of those things wrong uh, as they were being said because they're always, they're always just so gray and so uncertain and we're just trying to, it's just fun, basically. And if that's all you're doing it for is fun, that's fine, but just keep it out of the Christian pulpit. Amen. Like at home, you can have your charts and you can have all your maps and you can be marking everything and you can get all your news tickers from around the world trying to pinpoint things as a hobby. As long as it doesn't interrupt your church attendance and as long as it doesn't interrupt your Christian witnessing, leading others to Jesus, and as long as it doesn't disturb your joy, as long as it doesn't take your peace, as long as it doesn't scare you, you can have a hobby like that. Maybe it'd be fun. On the other hand, a lot of times it just turns people all apocalyptic. Reminds me of that movie where people are standing, the aliens have invaded, and the ship is above the town, and all the people are on the skyscraper, and they're, they got signs thinking, you know, saying, you know, we come, welcome to America, welcome to the world. And then the, the alien ship blasts them and just kills them all. <laughs> just a bunch of, we don't want to fall, we don't want to fall into the nutty category, okay? We're strange anyway, because we believe in God. We don't want to be nutty believers in God. We want to be righteous believers in God. And so, so when the question is asked, well, where is the, the Antichrist going to come from? Some scripture very clearly alludes to him coming from Rome. Okay, the empire that was killed and then comes back. 
so most likely he's going to come from Rome. But then most likely he's probably going to be a Syrian. And then he could possibly, some say he could be Greek or some say he could be Jewish, and there's reasons for that. I'm not going to get into the guesswork. Uh, but really it could be a bunch of, it could be a combination of all of it. Remember how Jesus was prophesied that he would come from Nazareth and then he would come out of Egypt and then he would be from Bethlehem? How could you have all three of those? Or Nazareth, you know, so it, can, it could all be possible. Uh, he could be a national, uh, his nationality could be one thing, but then he could come from Rome and he could be born of the Jewish faith in some manner. So it could all come to pass. Uh, but the bottom line is see to it that you're not troubled. Didn't Jesus say that? Amen. He said, one command concerning these things that would start to happen in the earth, he said, see to it that you're not troubled. Got it? Amen. So don't get troubled. In John 14, Jesus said, just before he's about to leave the earth, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So none of these things should cause you to be afraid or troubled. All right, And you could even apply this to what do I do about it? Well, you don't do anything about it. You certainly don't hoard up food for the tribulation. Amen. That's troubling. Amen. To have to rotate food and supplies until the last day would be a lot of trouble. Don't be troubled. And then some people start wondering if they're ever going to have to meet the Antichrist. You know, the truth is, if you're living for Jesus and actually care about your salvation, you'll be out of here. You won't even have to worry about taking the number 666. Amen. Now, if they start requiring somebody to put a number on us or somebody to put a chip in us, which that's very likely that the, the mark of the beast will be a computer chip that then you, can, you can't buy or sell without it. Uh, most likely that's the way. Well, I'm never going to take one of those. Nobody's ever going to get to command me to take one of those. How about you? At the same time, it's not going to happen. We're not going to be here when that takes place. When the Antichrist requires it, we're not going to be here. So we have a whole series in the bookstore called The End Times that puts all this together. It's like six hours of stuff. I'm not doing six hours this time, okay? We're just going to pinpoint some things about the Antichrist, but I want to show where it fits and show you how you don't have to be upset or afraid or scared. Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And then it says, Unto them that eagerly wait for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So all you got to do is eagerly wait for Jesus. Now, if you don't care about Jesus, you might be in, in for something, right? If you're not expecting Jesus, if you don't desire to see Jesus, because there's probably some believers that could, are very careless and, and don't really want to serve God and don't really care to see Jesus. Well, they might have to stick around during the tribulation, but anybody who's in church every Sunday is probably seeking God with their heart, right? In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, Because you've kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation. That would be the seven-year tribulation that he's speaking of. Which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no man take your crown. So there's command throughout Scripture that tells us you hold fast, and then you'll escape the wrath to come. Luke chapter 21 says, that you be counted, watch and pray that you may, be, you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Well, what's worthy? Well, we've already read some of the things that make you worthy. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. For God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can escape the wrath of God that comes on this world. We can escape the battle of Armageddon. We can escape the Antichrist rule. We don't even have to be around for that. Just live for God and care about it. Even though you're not going to be, you may not be perfect, but you're not going to be in darkness. It's the people in darkness that have to meet the Antichrist. You got it? So, matter of fact, he won't even be revealed. We will not even know who the Antichrist is. We're going to be out of here. We will not even know who the Antichrist is. We're out of here. So no need to try to guess now. What a waste of time. I mean, Scripture says He will not be revealed until we're gone. Until He that lets or allows will allow. Until we're taken out of the way, He will not even be revealed. So, But we'll read that in a moment. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. 
And let's pass by Revelation 4 just so you can see something here. Revelation chapter 4. Now this is the book of the Revelation. The Revelation is not the Revelation of the end times. It's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the Revelation of the Messiah and all things related to the Lamb of God. So when you read Revelation, it's not to spook you. It's to help you realize how important and how powerful Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, really is. Now, Revelation chapter 1 through 3 is Jesus speaking to the church. And the word church is mentioned 19 times in Revelation 1 through 3. Jesus has words to tell to the seven churches of that day in this certain area. Uh, but then chapter 4 verse 1 says, After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you things which must take place after this. After what? After this church discussion. And so after chapter 3, you never see the word church mentioned in Revelation. Why? Because we're in heaven. We've been raptured to heaven. So chapter 4 begins the seven-year tribulation, basically. He sees a couple things, and then he gets right to the seven seals which are opened, and then the seventh seal has the seven trumpets that come. All of that is the judgment upon earth during the tribulation period. You got it? Some of you got it, and if you don't, that's okay. So that's just one little proof that we are in the tribulation and the Christians are not here. Now, or we could say the church is not here. Now, there will be people in the earth becoming Christians because there's going to be Bibles still around. There's going to eventually be 144,000 Jewish uh, believers, Jewish Christians, who are preaching the gospel all over the place and getting tons of people saved during the tribulation period. We won't be there. So when it talks about saints, it's not talking about us. The saints and the martyrs in the earth of that day will be all those who get saved after the rapture. So here we are in Revelation chapter 13 when the Antichrist is mentioned. So let's start here and read verse 1. Revelation 13, 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the feet of a lion, or the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that's the devil, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the devil will be the possessor of the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now some people think the Antichrist is going to die and get resurrected from the dead. I don't think that's what this says. It says one of his heads, which represents a kingdom. The heads represent kingdoms. One of his kingdoms was as if it had been mortally wounded. So it looks like one kingdom gets almost crushed, but then was healed and comes back to life. And then once this kingdom comes back to life, people are going to honor the king of that kingdom, the Antichrist. Verse 4, So they worshipped the dragon, that's the devil, who gave authority to the beast. So because the devil seems to give authority to the Antichrist, people will worship. And they worshipped the beast, the Antichrist, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, it probably is not referring to one man. It's probably referring to one man in his kingdom. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Stop there. I think you want your name in the book. Amen. Simple as that. You want all your friends' names in the book. Or if they are alive during the tribulation, they will have to worship the beast, the Antichrist. Now turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. Verse 8. Or I'll, 
I'll, I'll read verse 7. The angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will, will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and, and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, or we could say seven kingdoms. This is Revelation 17, 9, on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, and is the seventh, and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast or the Antichrist. They will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. That's us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let me give just a quick summary or a recap of this. All this refers to is the fact that there are seven kingdoms and actually ten kings. The Antichrist is the eighth that rises up and uproots three of the kings. Okay? And so Daniel chapter 7 prophesies this about the coming Roman Empire. So we believe, most theologians believe, the ten kingdoms are in Europe. You got it? and that that's where the control will take place. Now the scripture says that people over the whole earth will worship the beast, but his control will be in Europe. It looks like primarily or exclusively in Europe, ten kingdoms, which everybody's trying to decide which ten, which ten kingdoms are in there. Could it be the United Nations? All this guesswork, we don't really know what, how it's going to happen. So every time something happens, it's like, ah, it looks like it could be headed this direction, but then again, it doesn't really give us much fruit because we already know what's going to happen anyway. We're not even here. So if it's just for fun, that's one thing, like I said, but it's not going to really help you today. Everybody okay with that? No. Now in the end time series, we, we went to the Daniel scriptures, which really predicted all of this and how it's going to happen. And then you can apply which nations it was referring to in Daniel. But we're not going to do that today. I just want to mention a couple things uh, about the Antichrist further. He is known as the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 10. He is called the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14. He's called the spoiler in Isaiah 16. He's called the extortioner in Isaiah 16, uh, well, same scripture. He's called Gog and the prince of Mesha and Tubal in Ezekiel 38. He's called the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. He's called the king of fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8. He's called the prince that shall come in Daniel chapter 9. He's called the king of the north in Daniel 11. He's called the man of sin in Thessalonians. He's called the son of perditions, son of perdition. He's called the wicked in Isaiah. He's called that wicked one in 2 Thessalonians. He's called the beast as we just read. And one other fact about him is that he will have no regard for the desire of women. Now, people have imagined what that might be. Most likely, either he's homosexual or asexual or whatever that would be that you're not interested in anything sexual. But it says he has no regard for the desire of women. I think that's where some people thought he might be a pope. Uh, but he could be of any religion, basically. Maybe it's Islam. Maybe it's not. doesn't really matter to us. So, now I want to get into really the heart of the message. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you'll turn there, please. Again, we, we have taught on this exclusively or, or extensively in, in the series. But, you know, every time I do that, uh, some clarity comes, but it, it's so much prophetic uh, stuff from the Old Testament tying it into something that it's, uh, people get a little bit confused no matter who you're listening to. And then sometimes even the preacher gets confused. <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, she said God did it that way. Yeah, God didn't make it perfectly clear and I think that's okay. 
I mean, can't you tell he didn't make these end time stuff perfectly clear? And I think that's okay. He gives us, he gives us a fuzzy picture so that we know what we're headed for. He just doesn't let us see it perfectly clear yet. It's no big deal. We're headed in the right direction. And that's really all that matters. That we ought not be walking in darkness knowing this stuff's coming. Right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Joni, Joni says that uh, growing up she was trained in a few ways of Christ and had been saved as, an, as a child. And, um, but one thing that she knew that her family kind of imparted to her was you don't want to be found in that movie theater or wherever when Jesus comes. <laughs> And so she didn't do a whole lot of bad stuff because she didn't want to be caught if Jesus came that day. <laughs> Which, in a simpler time, that was very serious business. Now we think we know everything because we've got all this media stuff, so we're like these, these huge brainiacs. We're like overthought everything. Oh, it would be okay. And we've calculated, but, but that, that'll keep you out of trouble. If you'll just be honest with, with that, expecting that he might show up today, If you thought he might show up today, I bet you'd stay in church longer. <laughs> if we thought he was coming today, people wouldn't try to have just one hour long churches. Oh, now, now I'm really picking on people. Okay. <clears throat> I used to think it'd be so wonderful if Jesus came during church. I'm thinking he probably will come to church, come, come during church. You know, he, he will, the trumpet will sound while we're all in church, don't you think? Yeah. But then, then I thought, wait, wait, once you get a world view, you realize that not everybody's in church at the same time around the world. <laughs> so you're a, little, you're a little selfish there thinking about it's all about you in your country. <laughs> so that doesn't really fit. All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go there. You there? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, what day? The day that Christ comes? Will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, when he's talking about that day, m more times than not, he's talking about the day Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when Jesus comes back to earth with us to rule to, to wipe out the, the evil on the, during the battle of Armageddon and then set up kingship and rulership with us in the, in the earth for a thousand years. All right? So maybe before we read the rest of this, let me give you the, the summary of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be a natural man who rises to power under the influence of Satan. He'll reign over a kingdom, a new kingdom alliance in Europe, one of those kingdoms will almost be destroyed in battle by the sword, but then it'll come back to power and amaze people so much they begin to worship the Antichrist and the image of the Antichrist being con uh, controlled and deceived by the false prophet. Now, once we're taken out of the way, then the judgment begins and the Antichrist begins to rule. And then he reigns in peace for three and a half years, promising peace to the world or at least to the ten nations. The Jews fall for it. Everybody falls for it. But then when the temple of Jerusalem is rebuilt at the midway point during that seven years, the Antichrist will stand in the holy place, declare himself God, thereby defiling the temple. And then the Jews will say, oh, he deceived us. And so that begins three and a half years of terror for the Jews especially, but that's when the armies converge upon Jerusalem for the final day battle. So there's persecution and judgments and all sorts of things happening in the final three and a half years. And then 
Armageddon comes on the final day. Jesus comes. He sets foot on the Mountain of Olives. He comes with ten thousands of His saints. That's us. And so the final battle of Armageddon or the battle of Megiddo begins with us plus Israel against the Antichrist and all nations who've gathered against Israel. It's a one-day battle. The angels help us, then it's over. And then the Antichrist and false prophet are cast into, actually chained, cast into the lake of fire. The devil is cast into the bottom, bottomless pit for a thousand years. So Antichrist, false prophet go on the lake of fire. Antichrist, I mean, uh, the devil is chained for a thousand years. The, uh, Jesus sets up His earthly kingdom. We're glorified. We're already glorified. Our bodies are already glorified. That's why we get to rule for a thousand years. We don't have to die because we've been glorified at the rapture. At the end of the thousand years, the devil is loosed for six months to tempt those who lived during that thousand years but were never tempted. And then God gathers the nations against the saints, or the, the devil gathers the nations against the saints in the beloved city, and fire comes down from God out of heaven, devours them all. Then the devil is cast into the lake of fire, uh, along with everyone else who's not in the book of life. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. There's no more curse, no more sadness, no more darkness, no more sin, no more anything. Not even any more night. So that those of you who are night lovers, it's over for you. <laughs> <clears throat> and we will serve God and reign forever in righteousness. That is our expectancy. That is what's going to happen. Amen. Regardless of what people believe, that stuff will happen. But let's get back here to put it together. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That means there's going to be a falling away. It means people, even believers in God are going to fall away from righteousness or reality, fall away from Christ. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or his worship, so that he sits as God in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in its own time? Now, if you have the King James, it says the word let and letteth a lot. Same word for restrain. There's something restraining all this from happening. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness, or the King James says mystery, mystery of iniquity, I believe. The mystery of iniquity or lawlessness or, or immorality is already at work. Only he, who is, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So, he who now restrains, now the word he is probably capitalized, but I'm not so sure it should be. Some people thought that was the Holy Spirit restraining, but we believe probably more precisely that it's not the Holy Spirit who's stopping the, the Antichrist, it's the Christians, the church stopping the Antichrist from being revealed. As long as we're here, he cannot be revealed. As long as we're doing our gospel work, as long as we're still in the earth with the Holy Spirit, then the Antichrist cannot wreak havoc on the earth. Verse 8, And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, so you, you won't be deceived by the Antichrist. None of you need to be concerned about that. That's one reason why we don't need to be trying to pick him so we can avoid him. It's not a big deal. You're not going to be deceived. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So this is why he gets to deceive them, because they didn't receive the truth. Think about, have you ever seen a sinner who just wouldn't understand? Have you ever seen a sinner who was just so blatantly ignorant and not willing to learn the truth. Amen. Well, you're going to see it more and more and more and more. And the reason is because God lets them be like that. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. 
And for this reason, God will, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. You'd wonder how can all the nations of the world fall for it? Because they didn't want the truth, God let them get deluded. He let them get deceived. Verse 12, that they may be all condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Pretty quiet in here. Let me repeat verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then the lawless one is revealed. So lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now we are still here, so we're restraining. And then when we're taken out of the way, the Antichrist gets to show up. But until then, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. The lawless one has a spirit. It's the spirit of lawlessness. The spirit of lawlessness is already here. You can see that. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. Now we're going to switch from talking about a person called Antichrist who's possessed by the devil to the spirit of Antichrist which pervades the world and influences people toward the devil, for the devil, and away from Christ. Remember that the word for Antichrist is the opposite of the Messiah. The anti-Messiah. 1 John chapter 2. And so what, what, this, this is where you do need to be warned. You and I do need to be aware. We're not worried about who the Antichrist person is. But you do need to uh, notice and be aware of and resist... Yes. The spirit of the Antichrist. Yes. The spirit of lawlessness yes. because it can mess people up. It can even mess Christians up. You have to stiff arm it. You have to resist the devil and the spirit that he's put into the world against Christ. Yes. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. What does that mean? Well, one is capitalized, talking about the person. The other is not capitalized, talking about other people influenced by the spirit of Antichrist, possessed by the devil, not to do what the Antichrist does, but to influence the world in a similar manner of lawlessness. By which we know it's the last hour. Because we see this spirit of lawlessness pervading the world, we know it's the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. And so verse 20 is a scripture that I'm going to tack on here just because it's a good one. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So just always keep that in mind. You, actually, you know. In your heart, you know. So don't get moved mentally by any facts or anything happening out there. Verse 22, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Anybody who doesn't accept that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah doesn't have the Father either. Look at chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Notice the context of a great scripture we always use. It's in context of not feeling afraid of the Antichrist spirit. Pretty simple, huh? Look at 2 John chapter 1. 
verse 7. 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So let's talk about the spirit of this thing. The spirit of the antichrist that's messing with people all over the world. What does it look like? What is that? Well, I think you can see it pretty clearly around the world. You can see it in this culture. Uh, you can see some of the warnings, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. What a twist to twist Christ, completely a 180 turn to call an evil thing good and a good thing evil. Can I give an example of that? Sure. Uh, somebody says, I'm coming out as homosexual, and, and somebody says, that's so wonderful. I'm so proud of you for exposing your immorality. <laughs> and then they look at Christians and say, why are you telling him that he's wrong? That's bad. Simple flip-flop where we can no longer talk about what's right and wrong. You know, the philosophers call it moral relative. Moral relativeness, okay? That no, nobody has a right to say what a moral is because that's up to the person. So it's relative. Morality is relative. Whatever, what you think is right and wrong is different from what you think is right and wrong. And so we can't really compete with morals because who knows who's correct? Well, moral relativity means that that statement itself might not be right. When you say that no moral statement can be accepted as truth, even that statement has to be in question. So you can trick the philosophers if you really have to. But that's the spirit of the Antichrist. Because those people always deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They always deny. Because if they were to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, then what Jesus said matters and that God is real. And if God is real, then morality is found in the Scriptures. The only way you can ignore all of it is if you don't accept God or accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Amen. So immorality spreads because of that. Lawlessness will abound in these last days. Matter of fact, let's go over to 2 Timothy and just read a little list of what lawlessness looks like, what a lack of restraint looks like. So if you combine 2 Timothy chapter 3 with hating all things Christian, you'll find exactly the spirit that has divided the country and has spread across the whole wide world. Even in educated lands, even in first world nations, they have this problem. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, Know this, in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blaspheming God and blaspheming people as well. Think about how, how blasphemy of God has always been, as far as we know, but blasphemy of people in, uh, in social media or on the news or just on plain all media, people think they have a right to just blast everybody. Just blaspheme the character of anybody if you want to. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people turn away. Notice all those little descriptions. Make sure it's none of you. I mean, that's how you have to do this. Make sure it's none of you. You know, lawlessness means you hate authority. Think of how much hatred there is to toward authority these days. Even toward parents. Kids hate to be told what to do by parents. Hate to be told what to do by teachers. Right? Hate to be spanked. I'm calling the cops. Oh, I hate the cops too. <laughs> hatred of, of the law. Hatred of police. That's predicted. That's lawlessness, even if they have their own reasons. No shame doing and saying things that are just humiliating to yourself and to those around you. People have no shame in their actions. Lawlessness. 
there's a growing sense of indecency around the world. I mean, just think of the, the middle school kids wearing their pants halfway down their legs. If you approach them to talk about it, well, it's just style. It's how to, no, that's not decent. But one side says, well, it's just up to them. Everybody can do what they want to. How about ruining your body in various ways? Just, just the most despicable ways possible. Well, it's, just, it's, up, it's up to me. Well, it's lawlessness. There's no sense of order or righteousness or morality. That's the spirit of Antichrist. So you resist it. When it tries to get into you thinking, well, it's not a huge deal to do this or that and the other. It might be. And you need to be aware of that so that you don't let the spirit of Antichrist bother you and mess with you and make you look wrong. Right? Amen. Yield your members to righteousness rather than lawlessness. Amen. Romans 6 says that. Yeah. Yield your members to righteousness rather than iniquity. Yeah. That you, were, you should be ashamed of those things that you used to do. Same word, lawlessness and iniquity. Yield your members to what is right rather than something that's dirty and wrong. Amen. But think of how the world doesn't know this. And think of how the unlearned church doesn't know this stuff. And so we just kind of move along with culture not recognizing that that's how the devil's going to mess with. That's how he's going to control people. The new God is, rather than God or rather than the Word of God or rather than Jesus, the new God is tolerance. Isn't that right? We're, we're, the, the worst sin is no longer murder. I mean, if there was a scale. The worst sin is not what terrorists could do. The worst sin is calling that terrorist religion wrong. The worst sin is intolerance more so than every other sin. Yes. I'm, I, tolerance, tolerating everybody's difference, is the new God. Yes. That's the one that the unsaved people will hate you for. Yes. No other sin matters almost, it seems. Except, as, long as, you, as long as you accept me for me. Well, we Christians believe in tolerance. We believe in tolerating everybody. But we also believe that some people are just plain wrong. Me tolerating you doesn't mean I don't think you're wrong. Me tolerating you means I love you anyway. Amen. So tolerance does not, for the Christian, tolerance does not mean we hate anybody. Tolerance means we love everybody with the love of God. But we certainly know who's doing right and who's doing wrong by your actions. And we have a right to call out what's right and what's wrong, what's moral and what's immoral. And we certainly have a right to explain true religion and how Jesus Christ is the only way to God. We don't have to tolerate other religions in the fact of they're okay as well, that everyone has their own way. No, everyone has their own way in some ways are just plain wrong. So you and I have to let people know that Jesus is the only way. Even though you think you have a way, your way is wrong, buddy. We owe it to them. Now sometimes you don't come at them like that, you come at them with love. On some have compassion making a difference, but on others, save with fear. What does that mean? That means i got to warn you, buddy. You're wrong. You're in danger of hair, hellfire. Right. That's it. Or you could just add, him, add the Antichrist to it. i got to warn you, buddy. You're in danger of meeting the Antichrist face to face. Yes. Amen. Matthew chapter 24 says, Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. You can sense that happening. Lawless, when iniquity and lawlessness abounds, the love of people gets hardened, seared, careless. They despise easier. Nothing really matters. Think of the insensitivity just because of television. How? Think of somebody, if they did not know, if they'd never seen a television, if they turned it on and saw the wacky stuff, let's just say weird murders and all sorts of things on a movie, their heart would be like, oh my gosh, people are getting killed. But we've seen it on TV so many times, we know it's fake, it doesn't even bother us anymore. Or does it? Maybe it should. Maybe we should more, be more sensitive to what we're seeing. Maybe that is the spirit of lawlessness. The love of many grows cold when we just let it in and we don't even care. You know, bad things are happening to people. It's like, well, I can't go help them. I'll just film them. <laughs> Think how weird stuff has gotten. It's got to be the spirit of Antichrist.
Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Think, think about, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Praise the Lord, we've got three services to make up for it, no problem. <laughs> you know, think of just the lawless personal life that the world pushes. Amen. Do whatever you want to do, it doesn't really matter, do whatever you want to do. Well, be, your, no, be yourself is the big thing, right? Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Well, that's not a bad instruction for Christians. It's not a bad instruction on one level of don't try to be like everybody else. You can be your own person. Um, that's kind of okay. But in Christianity, we're really supposed to be like Jesus. And we're supposed to be like Paul the Apostle. And we're supposed to follow those in the faith who are doing it right. So there is some conformity in Christ. We're supposed to be conformed in Christ. Not that we're all puppets or robots. But we don't just get to be ourselves. Amen. We get to be our new selves. So yes. it works if you preach it right into the Christian church. Yes. But to just tell an old sinner to be yourself doesn't always work. Uh -huh. To tell a sinner to be themselves, what if that person is a monster? Just be yourself. <laughs> what if they're sadistic on the inside? Oh, just be yourself. Oh, really? I can just be myself. Good. Give me a knife. <laughs> it only works if you're moral. It only works if you have a, a strong character. Amen. What if you're mean? What if you're self-injurious? What, you, what if you're self-idolizing? Just be yourself. And so they just, oh. <laughs> what if you're defamatory toward God or toward people? Just be yourself, they say. I'm just being myself. I'm just saying what I want to. I have free speech. I'm just saying what I want to. All right. But you know all this. I'm just exposing it so that we can all admit it and so that you know that your thoughts have been okay about it. Je the scripture says about Jesus that because Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, God anointed him. That means he put his spirit on him. That means he gave him power. And it says above everybody else. It's like the prerequisite for Jesus getting power was not just that he was born of a virgin. It was that he loved what was right and hated what was wrong. Yes, and he got the power of God on him. Amen. If you want the power of God in your life, you're going to have to love righteousness and hate lawlessness. Amen. So you're going to have to resist some things. Yes. You're going to have to resist the, the freedom from all regulation of your life. So when, when you have the thought, oh, well, I can just be a little loose here and there. I can just do a little bit. It doesn't matter too much. Okay, you can have the spirit of lawlessness on you for a little while. Is that what you're saying? That was the main point for today. Just to make sure that we recognize the spirit of Antichrist is already here. Lawlessness is already abounding. The Antichrist has not yet come and been revealed. So you don't have to be concerned about him, but you do have to be concerned about the attitude that he gives to the world. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.